Hello again, everyone. It's time for another episode of Enterprise Linux Security. I'm here, as I am with every episode, with Zhao. How are you doing? All good, Jake. As usual, it's a pleasure being here with you. Yep. And, you know, I, I love this podcast. I, I think I'm a little biased, but um, <laughs> we're trying to leave our bias at the door, though, because we have some stories to talk about where, um, you know, bias in favor of something, and we'll get to that in a minute, might actually work against you because we have some news stories to talk about, and many of which the angle is going to be, you know, geared more towards the um, non-enterprise user. But there's some enterprise lessons that we can learn from this as well, especially as many of these people that fall victim to certain things, they, well, probably have a job and they probably have access to something important. So it gets harder and harder to draw the line. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's we look really at the, are. the first one that we have here lined up. Mm -hmm. And uh, for usual listeners, we you might remember us discussing something that happened a few months ago and that just mix it all together. Right. Uh, but we discussed an attack on the, on the supply chain where the, the developer would cripple his own libraries because he wasn't happy with how open source was treating them and how large companies were using their his code uh, without paying him. So he decided to roll out an update that just broke the, the libraries. And this week, um, a type of attack that caused a similar, I don't know, it's a similar vector, but it's not exactly the same thing. Um, some developers are deciding to take a political stance uh, on the current war, and they decided to submit some code for their own projects, for their own Node.js libraries. I believe this was another Node.js library, where they added code that detected your location, and if you were one of, if you were located in Russia or Belarus or Belarusia, you would have your all your data wiped out from your hard disk. And yeah, there are so many things wrong with this, and it's come on. hard Again, to, it's, to start. It's the usual. You cannot make this stuff up. No, <laughs> it, it's like it, it, there's just so. Like I said, there's just so many avenues of wrong that it's hard to find the first wrong to talk about. I guess one that we could consider bringing up first is the fact that. Um, there's actually, you know, going to be people that are trying to help the situation. And by, you know, it's like if you put an up, uh, you know, something out there that does this, then you don't know whose hard disk is being wiped. Yeah, it's, it might look at some kind of geographical information, but at the same time, um, it's going to be doing more harm than good because even the people that are trying to help could find themselves with all their data completely wiped out. So, um, Obviously, this is just a bad idea all around. Um, but again, it's just one of those things we're going to have to dissect and explore yeah. because um, there's a lot to this. Yeah, there is really a lot of angles that we can cover on this one. And we usually do not touch the political aspect of this, but I'm going to open a small exception here. Mm -hmm. Not everybody in a country represents the same ideals as the leaders of that country. Right. Okay. This may come as a as a shock to some people, but not everybody agrees with the leader all the time. Targeting everybody in a specific country that is using your code and attacking their systems will, for sure, hit lots of unintended targets there. You will yeah. be hitting people that are, for example, against the current situation, that are trying to fight the government on this. And they already have a pretty hard situation there. And you're just making it harder on those people. So exactly. I mean, it could just screen be, it like this. It's, I mean, and it's it's kind of hard too because you know when it comes to IP, I mean, there, there's different ways of finding where someone is located if they're in a certain country or not. But um, you know, I remember when you know one of the IPs that I received quite a while back. Um, I'm pretty sure it was saying that I was in a different country, although I wasn't. And the issue was, I think, um, where I got the IP from, they, they probably purchased it from yeah. somewhere else that was in that location. But now that IP address was actually a Michigan, United States um, IP address with the ISP I was using at the time. And uh, But anytime I would, you know, go up to, you know, like a site 
what is my IP address.com? If I forgot what it was, it would say I'm somewhere, you know, across the ocean. No, I'm actually not. I'm right here. Like there's all these different edge cases where just like you were saying, there's going to be innocent bystanders here that have nothing to do with this. And, you know, they could be on the right side here. They, they want to see this conflict resolved and over with, and they're really sad about it as we all are. And then next thing you know, their family pictures are wiped out of their pictures directory along with everything else. Um, yeah. That is just, not going to help anyone. Yeah, and like you said, GYP location, it's not like it's 100% uh, accurate. It actually, it's not even close to 100% accurate for many reasons. First, because not everybody is using IPv6 as they should. IPv6 migration, it's a pipe dream. It's never going to happen. We'll have IPv4 for many, many years. Forever. And the thing is, IPv4 <laughs> addresses are basically all used up. So companies are buying them from whoever still has them free. So an ISP on the United States might be buying IP blocks from a country in Africa, for example. And until the GeoIP database is updated to reflect that change, it will show the people using them, like you just said, being somewhere else very far away from where they actually are. And this type of attack, where it just looks at the IP addresses and the GeoIP database, it's going to be hitting the wrong people just because of that. Not all the other issues notwithstanding, just because it's a poorly done way, a poorly implemented way of actually pulling off something like this. And we are going to get into the other issues, but that issue alone, it's going to hurt a lot of people not in those countries. And it's right. really stupid to do it this way. Yeah, so we will have a, we have a lot more to dissect, but I um, yeah. just want to uh, mention that we will have a link to this, obviously, wherever you got this episode from, there's going to be a link there to this opensource.org article that actually talks about this. So let's continue to dissect it. Yeah. So another thing is that, uh, like in the case of that developer that uh, intentionally crippled his own code, you're introducing malicious behavior on your libraries on purpose. Introducing malicious behavior in code, that's a crime, OK? Right. Sure, it's your code, but it's still a crime. <laughs> and you're intentionally crippling whatever it was supposed to be doing. If you're not happy with how it's being used, stop developing, move away from the project. If somebody right. else thinks it's interesting, it's open source, they can pick it up, they can fork it, whatever. If you're not happy with how it's being used, if you don't want it to be used in this pro in these places or all that, tough luck, it's open source, it's out there. Just if you're not happy, move away. But crippling right. it like this, it's not the solution. And you're actually getting yourself in trouble. Right. And this is going to be causing lots of damages to lots of systems. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it. I mean, similar. I mean, if you're a locksmith and you make locks, and a homeowner is using your lock for their front door, and you don't like the color of their front door, just because you made the lock doesn't mean you get to go over there and sabotage the lock because they are using it in a way you don't want to. I mean, I know in this case, analogy. take down the house. <laughs> right. I mean, it's you know. When we put something out in public domain, we have to understand the fact, and we covered this in um, a recent episode of the Home Lab show as well, that um, you really don't have a say in where that code ends up, and it's going to end up in places you'd never expected, and that's just the trade-off. The benefits of open source more than make up for that, but if you're fixated on that one thing, like you were saying, just do something else. It's not for you. Yeah, you need to realize that when you're going into open source, you're giving up control of your code and how it's going to be used because you're putting it out there and anybody can, according to the license that you set up on it, use it for their own purposes. And that's how it's supposed to be. Just yeah. because you don't agree with those purposes, tough luck. <laughs> it's part yeah. of the game. For all if you, you don't want it to be used for that, either write, yeah. down, write that down on the license agreement. It can be used for this, this, and that, except in this situation or except in this country or whatever then you might have some footing. If you don't do that, you're just malicious. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and, and yeah, to your point, I mean, you, you don't know where your code's going to go. You could just create a simple um, C program that makes LEDs blink, right? And the next thing you know, a shoe manufacturer is making light-up sneakers that uses your code to make the LEDs in the shoes blink. You never know. Anything could happen. So, yeah, you're right. But anyway, yeah. back to the point, um, you know, that's, kind of the case here they like do you, do you think that the individual i mean the, do, do they think they're helping here or they have to know that i mean <laughs> That's sometimes the they have a uh, they do sense. believe they're helping this is called protest where they're protesting right. and this is the way that they found to, to protest 
Come they're, on. They're, yeah. <laughs> burn your own house down while you protest, why don't you? <laughs> there are so many things wrong with this. On the far end of the spectrum, there will be cyber attacks going on on both sides of the of this conflict. You might be hitting the wrong side, the one that you're not trying to, because you might have hackers from the side that you're supporting doing an attack through a VPN connection, so their IP will be showing up as they're being on that, the opposite side, the one that you disagree with, and you'll be hitting those as well. Okay. Yep. And yep. yeah, it's just another of the many wrong things with this type of, uh, of decision. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, to, to quote the article directly, I mean, they're literally saying that um, protest is an important element of free speech that should be protected. But they go on to say, you know, there's a right way to exercise your freedom of speech and your right to protest. That's not going to backfire and um, actually end up making the situation worse. And um, regardless of whether you, like you're saying, you wrote the code or not, if it's in someone else's system, I mean, that is sabotage, period. End of discussion. That is absolutely sabotage. And um, worse, you don't even know who's going to end up getting sabotaged by this at the end yeah. of the day. It's malware. <laughs> Basically, what you created yeah. is a virus. Yep. Congrats. Congratulations. If that was your intention. Congratulations. It's now going to be picked up by antivirus. You're famous. Yeah. You've had your 15 minutes now. So, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh out, out of frustration. Seriously. By the way. It's the, not this funny. This is, <laughs> it's really out there. How somebody thought they were helping out doing this, it's amazing. The, the mental gymnastics that go into your thought process to make this up as something positive, it's incredible. Might not even be that. Might just be like, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, gave it about a minute of thought and did it. Um, I'll show them. And yeah, anyway. You know, that's why Google introduced something on the Gmail labs that was the, <laughs> something that prevented you from sending emails late at night and you had to fill out this mathematical equation before you actually could press send. Just to make sure you were not drunk when you did uh, when you did that. Oh and my there's God. There's something like this, okay? When you're submitting code, you should have to pass a sanity test. If you're not sane enough to do that, you shouldn't be committing your code. Or just even, I, I know this would be this would never happen because it's it's in, invading privacy. But to have some kind of way like to detect you, you're very angry today. Are you really sure you want to <laughs> put in that? You, you want to um, you know write your own pull request and accept your own yeah. pull request and push it out? You probably shouldn't do it because you are very angry at the moment. So I think you need to calm down a bit, and then we'll uh, then let us know if you want to try it again. You know, um, <laughs> I actually saw the guys from Level One News. I, I follow their news. Uh, mm -hmm. Their news shows. I believe it was last week. They actually had a story about this uh, research paper that did exactly what you just said. They would analyze your, they would use AI to analyze your behavior and find out when your mental state was angry or something like that. And then they could that, take action on that. And that was one of the examples that they gave, that using that as a prevention when you were submitting code so that you don't make commits angry. Can we at least get that for SMS messages that it kind of <laughs> <laughs> so people don't think that they regret and then have to backtrack? Anyway, yeah. Um, again, yeah, we're getting off into another yeah. um, thing altogether here. But yeah. Um, yeah, moral of the story, don't sabotage your code for any yeah. reason. If you think you're helping, you're not. Oh. Yeah. Come on, and code is not political. It's code. Don't yeah. make it more than it is. If you don't want it to be used for this, either stop working on it or don't make it out as public code because the moment that it's open source and it's out there in the public you lose the control to do that you do not yep. you no longer have the ability to do that i can i concur yeah All like right. any sane people would i believe but still i may be wrong um so let's move on to the next one i believe we've piped on a lot about yeah, this one and it's making one. us very angry and we we're going to start getting angry and we're going to start making comments. And then um, thankfully this isn't live yet. So I can delete anything that we say that, <laughs> I, I, that comes out of anger, but yeah, let's just stop. I mean, we get to that point. at this moment, if somebody decided to use that AI test to see our mental state before posting the podcast, they might not let us post the podcast. No, not <laughs> like, no don't do that. So yeah, let's move on to something much more interesting, which is the 2021 internet crime report from the FBI, which was just publicized. 
-hmm. And it's basically a roundup of uh, the major crime events related to cybersecurity that happened last year. Um, do note that this is more focused on end users than actually enterprise, but we will give you the enterprise angle on any on all of the the mentioned crimes here. Yeah. So do we and, want to cover the tech support scams first? Yeah, we'll go from the bottom up. So okay. they have a, a ranking there of the six more common, more prevalent attacks that they spotted last year. I believe this was crimes that were actually reported. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the sixth position, there are tech support scams. Um, you can look at this this way. This includes both things. It's either somebody phoning you saying that they're tech support from some company and asking for your credentials and you're giving them out, never give out your credentials. No tech support will ever ask you for your credentials for anything. And if they do, you should start doing business with them. And But this can also be looked at from the other angle, which is tech support does not have proper training. Right. And for example, SIM swapping um, attacks fall into this category. It's when you phone and when you phone your telecom company and you start up with your story, oh, I just lost my phone, I had lots of contacts, people have my number and I have a new phone and a new SIM card and I need my old phone number to work on this one. And you cry your heart out there and the other end somebody believes you and they will do the SIM swapping for you. And you're a malicious actor and now you receive all the text messages and you receive the call that the other person is going was going to receive and that includes multi-factor authentication tokens. You are going to receive those as well. And that's SIM swapping, and that falls under this category. And that's when you trick your, te your tech support technicians. Pardon for the yep. redundancy there. And basically what this tells us is that uh, the tech support people are being poorly trained, to say the least. This should be on their tech support 101 training session, whatever. You should never fall for this. Even if some companies will let you do SIM swapping, at least required the person to be in person at the store or at some point there to do the, the, the proper SIM swapping. And even then, try to properly assess the, the veracity of what you're hearing from the other end, because anybody can give you some fake tears and you'll fall right. for it. And yeah, my kids do it all the time. So uh, <laughs> early, let me tell you. Yeah, um, but uh, this will hurt the company and this can be used as part of uh, an attack that might not be directed at the company, but you will be party to, you will be helping out the bad guys on that situation if you're a telecom. So yeah, more training for your tech support. I kind of feel like another common thread that's gonna perpetuate throughout the po podcast is, um, you know, the fact that we we say, well, it should go without saying, but nothing does. Like, like we can think that all we want to. I don't even care if it's security yeah. related or not, um, because there's no matter what happens, we're always going to think, why did they think that's a good idea? Um, well, they didn't think it was, they didn't care or, you know, they didn't know they weren't properly educated. Who knows? But the fact is, um, it, it, it seems to go without saying, but it needs to be said every time. Yeah, most of the, the attacks that the FBI report mentions, they're basically the social engineering stuff at work. Like we saw when we discussed the lapses at the group, all those guys did was social engineering. They just took it to a different level. And not all the, the attackers will do that, but using social engineering will get you into lots of places. And this one, the tech support schemes, and the one after that, real estate and rental schemes, it's the same type of things. Uh, we're not going to lose a, to waste a lot of time on that real estate stuff because it's right. not directly IT related. No. We'll move on to the next one. But still, it's about people tricking other people. And people are always going to be the weak link here. If you can make somebody else believe what you're saying, even if it's not true, you're going to get them to act in a way that will help you. And yeah, that's social engineering at work. And yep. It, the big solution there is as always it's education. You need to train your users, you need to train your staff, you need to educate them better. You need to let them know that this is an issue, this is something real, this is not something that you see in the movies. And you need to give them the tools to work on this type of situation. Yep. For example, on the tech support, when somebody requires a SIM swap, for example, and I'm just going back to this because this has been in the news, this type of attacks, um, 
reinforce the idea that they should not do this without a very compelling reason and without some proof of identity from the other side that is not easily spoofable. I know that's hard to do, but right. this type of things should be hard to do. Not everybody should just be able to come up to you and say, oh, I need a copy of that SIM card over there. Because, oh, I'm so sad, I just lost my phone. They have to present proof of their their identity. They have to present you with something that confirms what they're saying, not just saying it on their own and taking that at face value. Right. Yeah, I mean, we want to think the best of people, right? But, you know, sometimes, yeah. I mean, actually often, it, it's just not what we think it is on the other end. And we really do need to stick to the policy. We need to be trained. We need to know what we can and can't do, what's required. Was there a checklist that we have to check a certain number of boxes before we um, divulge the information? Um, whatever it is, that th those things need to be in place and employees need to be aware of those things because that's going to come back and haunt you, if not. Yeah. So let's move on to the next one. Like I said, the, the fifth on this scale is the real estate and rental schemes. We'll not spend any time on this no. one and we'll move to number four, which is personal data breaches. Now, no. personal data breaches, we've mentioned this in the past lots of times here in the, in the podcast. Um, companies are not treating their data, their personally identifiable data, the one that they're storing on their systems. They're not giving them proper care and attention. Mm -mm. Um, this is where the exploits like the zero day exploits that you haven't patched yet. This is where the systems that you have not properly audited. This is where the backdoors that have been implanted in your infrastructure. This is where all of those things come into play. Um, we've seen also in the past that social engineering plays a big part of this, and it does. If somebody can get credentials into your systems, no amount of patching will save you. Right. But patching is the easy link there. It's what you can actually do and with the least amount of effort. I had a colleague stress that out to me yesterday on a call and a conversation, and, and that's actually a, a, a pretty valid point. <laughs> having a vulnerability in your system, having a patch available and not deploying it, that's like asking for trouble. That's getting the best house, the best security system, and leaving the windows open. Um, right. If the patch is available, if you know about it and you don't apply it, you're asking for this. And when you're when the data that you're storing leaks out, you're losing in many ways. You're losing in reputation. People will be more reluctant to trust you in the future with your with their data. You're opening yourself to liability, to financial liability. Say, for example, you're storing credit card information data. Oh boy. And <laughs> yeah. And you're opening yourself to fines for not meeting compliance, like the GDPR, which has pretty strict fines about this. Actually, Amazon last year reported the major fine yet under the GDPR on the third quarter financial result that they published last year, $700 million uh, that they paid in fine just for misusing data. It's a lot of money even for Amazon. Okay. Yep. And the excuse, I didn't know, will never work. No, never. It, it will never work. And come on. Having mm -hmm. systems up in production with patches waiting to be deployed, it's never a solution. Um, I'm going to brag again on my on our own work at the company. We provide you with live patching solutions. If you if your problem with deploying the patches is disrupting whatever you're doing, look at live patching. Uh, Texcare mm -hmm. has pretty good products around live patching. They will apply those patches for you on the fly without disrupting anything that you're doing, and your systems will be secure for this type of stuff. No yeah. system is 100% secure. Nobody will promise you 100% security, but leaving the stuff unpatched, that's a sure way to get hacked. Yeah, there's no 100% security, but there is definitely a way to uh, see, I mean, achieve 100% hackability on the other <laughs> yeah. end. Like if you leave everything wide open, you could definitely have 100% insecurity very easily or yeah. any percentage in between, you know, one and 100, but 100% secure isn't going to happen. But there's tools out there and, um, you know, there's many different ways to go about this. And especially when it comes to how you develop software, how you get products out the door. Um, but if you're given the solution on a silver platter, this will fix this particular issue and you don't want to have anything to do with it. Well, who's to blame if that vulnerability is the one that gets someone into your system? Yeah. And we have seen in the past that that's not the only way that hackers will get into your infrastructure. It's not just through exploits, but exploits are a big factor in this as well. 
yeah. when somebody gets into your infrastructure, lateral movement will usually happen because some systems are unpatched and have known exploits. And hackers will look for that. They get access into the infrastructure to some stepping stone uh, system somewhere. I don't know, that Raspberry Pi and the, the fake ceiling that we keep mentioning. And then they will look at other systems that they can see and try to see to find ways to get into those. Although I and, will say, though, that as much as, you know, I, I, that's the valid point. Nowadays, if someone sees a Raspberry Pi in the closet, they're probably going to steal it and sell it for like <laughs> uh, five times what it goes for because, you know, they're being scalped at the moment. But joking aside, um, if you have any reason to doubt, doubt, if you have any reason to distrust, distrust, and yeah. always just err on the side of ca caution, um, depending on what your role in the company is, educate your people or, um, you know, at least understand what's going on here. And, you know, one thing to make sure that I mention is that when I see data breach, and I'm trying to get out of this habit, but when I see the words data breach, I'm thinking, okay, was it a vulnerability chain? Was it one CVE that got somebody in? Um, did they find a weakness in the firewall somewhere? They were, you know, watching it for a week, trying to figure out how the packets are traversing and found the right order for port knocking to get into something. Um, that's immediately what my mind gravitates to. And, that, and any of those things could be the case. But it's also very possible that the individual who performed the breach was not technical at all and simply just called somebody, like you were saying, giving somebody a sob story. Hey, I need into the system. I, I need I need this. I need to get my job done, my work done, because I need in the, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the next thing you know, they get access because they managed to talk to the one person. Um, and that's very low tech. It could be in either end of the spectrum, but we need to approach you know, any security issue by not assuming the other end is a technical mastermind, they they might have just found a social engineering. And I think social engineering could and probably is a portion of every single thing on this list, actually. Yeah. And on the next one, confidence fraud, not the part of well trauma scams, but even then. Yeah. Um, confidence fraud is actually social engineering at work again. Um, it's when you get somebody to trust you or your systems implicitly without proper checking. Uh, for example, it's when somebody on the enterprise angle there, it's when you, you as an IT administrator, let somebody bring their phone and connect it to the network or bring their home device and plug it into the, the physical network at the, at the workplace. That's confidence fraud. If done maliciously with malicious intent, that's confidence fraud right there. Somebody is trying to hack into the system and you let them because you trust the peop the person or they gave yep. you that very sad story and you believe them or something like that. Or a third party contractor told you that they had this wonderful solution and they just have to get in to implement it and you let them. That's also confidence fraud. That's also right. something that happens. And again, we keep falling on the on the same thing here. It, this seems like a trend. Since that lapsus story, this seems like a like a trend. Social engineering is still playing a very decisive role on on hacks and security incidents, even uh, as far as 2022, as we've seen. And again, like I feel like I'm repeating myself, training your users, training your employees, and making sure that they are aware of the the issues around uh, sharing credentials, around trusting people implicitly, about not doing proper checking that has consequences and that has consequences to the company and that's very important yeah it, it absolutely is it's just um and i'll keep going back on the mindset over and over again because ultimately you know that's what it is but another aspect of the mindset is that i think it's pretty much commonly the case if not always the case like hackers will always use the path of least resistance, right? So if um, they know, let's just say hypothetically, they know your company in particular has not patched the firewall software and that company is, you know, a certain CVE they're vulnerable to and, you know, they can use that CVE to get into your system. But also that person might have found word that the receptionist might have some access that a receptionist might not have. Which one do you think they're going to do? Are they, are they going to hack into that firewall or are they going to pick up the phone and call the front desk and try to get a username and password? I guarantee you that it's always going to be easier if the person on the other end of the phone is you know easy, easily trusting everyone that they'll get that username and password before they even attempt to try that CVE because they're going to use the very easiest method to get into the company that gets them in quickest. It's not about 
cred. Like they have to use that vulnerability or other hackers aren't going to take them serious. We could argue that, but they don't care. They want in the system. They're going to get in the, the um, easiest way they possibly can every time. Yeah, absolutely. And this is also part of the the attack on the second the second on this list, which is investment scams and fraud. Again, it's implicit trust on somebody that's promising you miraculous solutions for problems. Those never exist. If they existed, they wouldn't be so hidden and nobody would have heard of them. Um, and <laughs> here I have to mention NFTs, for example. That's a pretty good scam also. So okay. if you're buying NFTs, if you're trading NFTs, I'm sure a very large portion of the value here, and you should check out the link to see the amount that I'm talking about. There are lots of numbers here. I won't try to pronounce this, but it's, uh, I don't know, a billion something like that dollars that were reportedly affected by this type of attack. It's a lot of money. NFTs are a large portion of that. Um, those types of investment, if you're a company and looking at, into that, you should look at somebody, something else. That's not the way to get money. There's no easy way. There never will be no. an easy way that's also legal to get money. And this mindset is everywhere because even outside of business, I had a, a friend when I was um, younger that would always buy these books or watch these videos that you know you would order about how to get rich or how to um, do this to end up getting millions of dollars or do that. And he was just buying this stuff. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, this company that you're buying these self-help get rich videos from, they're selling it, you know, probably to tens of thousands of people, but there's not tens of thousands of new millionaires. Hmm. Why is that? You know, but of course, easy money, right? It, it, it's, yeah. oh, wow, that's all I have to do. And I'll, I'll have a yacht. Sure. I'll do that right now. That sounds great. Um, but it, it's not that easy and it never will be. So, um, but people think like, you know, like that, it's just the way it is, unfortunately. Yeah, it's the same mindset as the gold rush in the US in the 19th yeah. century. <laughs> the guys that got rich were not the ones digging up for gold. It was the ones that were selling you the shovels and the, the equipment to use there. Those are the ones making the money. In this case, it's exactly the same thing. It's not you that's going to, pay to get rich from NFTs. It's the, the trading sites that you log into and take a cut from whatever you're selling and buying. It's the ones that are storing the NFTs and all that. It's not you as the end user that's going to be millionaire because of this. And yep. and here, to my own personal shame, I sold Bitcoins almost 10 years ago for two bucks and I thought I did a good a good sell at the time. <laughs> you never Bitcoins know, right? are not a solution either. And hindsight no. is 2020, but uh, yeah, I, me blames past me every single day because of that. Still, this yeah, type of, uh, of yeah. deals, they're not the, the right way to go ahead and they will never give you whatever they're promising. It's just not realistic to expect that. Even nope. <laughs> going back to crypto miners, again, personal shame, um, going back to crypto miners, the ones that are making money, sure, are the big farms and the guys with uh, uh, warehouses full of, uh, of GPUs that are uh, mining uh, Bitcoins. But the ones making the really big money, the one, the money that's actually legal and has no problems being traded and all that, are the ones that are selling you the equipment, are the ones that right. are selling you the, the GPUs in the first yep. place and the, the motherboards with 20 PCI slots that you can plug those GPUs into. Those are the ones making the big money. That, that's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, they're, they're the, the people that are in line like the night before yeah. at a store because they heard rumors that there's going to be an inventory drop of NVIDIA GPUs. Yeah. So they're camping out and they're going to buy like 10 of these things and then they're going to turn around and sell them for a huge markup and they're going to keep doing this and they're making a lot of money on this. Um, basically screwing over everyone like me that just wants to play a game every now and then yeah. or render a video. I'm not mining Bitcoin. I'm just rendering video, but I digress. Um, yeah, you're right. Those are the people that are making the loot here. Yeah. And even the companies making the GPUs. Sure, now there's a, <laughs> now you have a shortage of chips. And that's something real and something tangible. And they might have a tough time producing the cards in volume enough to, to meet the, the demand. But last year, two years ago, three years ago, they had more than enough components there to produce double or triple the amount of GPUs, and they never did. They just let the price soar. 
yep. this helps them as well. So yeah, everybody in the supply chain is getting really their cut on this, but the guys on the far end, not so much. They seem yeah. so, but they are only feeding the beast. There might be a shortage of parts, but I'll tell you what, on the spreadsheet, every single GPU we ship has been sold and it keeps being the case. It looks great to everyone looking yeah. at the metrics. Like we keep selling out of stores continually. Um, yeah, we have a shortage. We could be developing more anyway, um, but we sell out of every single piece of inventory. That's huge yeah. for a lot of yeah. companies out there. And people trusting in these miraculous solutions is what gets them into investment scams, scams and fraud. Yep. Moving on to number one, you have business email compromise in Not email a surprise accounts at all. in general. Not a surprise at all. People will nope. give out their credentials, people will use silly passwords for their accounts, and then their accounts get hacked. And just think about the amount of, of services that you have tied up into your email account, the ones that you reg registered in, home banking, your, I don't know, anything basically, any service on the internet that requires you to register will ask you for an email account. All those services will be tied into that email account. When somebody gets into it, that's not you. He has access to all those systems. Congratulations. Yep. I, I really wish I could remember the name of this individual who was a media person. This was quite a long time ago, but he was, a, I believe, a news person or blogger, and he was completely owned by somebody taking over all of his accounts. And rather than just kind of keep it on the down low, he... Um, you know, wrote an article, a detailed account of how exactly he was a victim and how he became to be a victim. And I'll try to find this article and put it in the show notes. But um, he did this because he wanted people to understand that, you know, it's not, as we say, like all these vulnerabilities. It's literally, if I remember correctly, somebody got into one account. They they got actually, no, what it was is they actually checked the Who Is database for his website, which had the address called another company who only needed to verify probably the address or something to give them access. So he got that access, which gave him the last four of the credit card number, which is exactly what this other company needed to verify his account. So he went over there, verified that account, this one, this one, and this one, um, just to get the uh, control of this person's Twitter handle because he just liked the Twitter username so much that, that he went through all this trouble to get it. And um, then after he got it, like wiped out his all his computers because they were synchronized to each other. So wiped the Mac, wiped the iPhone and all this other stuff and completely erased all of his data. Um, and, you know, check the article to be sure. But if I remember correctly, um, something like the the person who was taken advantage of was like, you know what, I'm not going to press charges if you just tell me everything and I'll just create this article or whatever. Um, again, check the article to be sure I'm not misremembering anything, but it's exactly the the story that just illustrates why we keep saying over and over and over again that training and education is everything because that literally is the best weapon that we have yeah there's no policy that you can put in place that your users will not find a way around right um, they are very creative when they're they trying to scheme on jobs so right. yeah if you make it easier on them they will find that uh, loophole and they will try to exploit that so yeah training you have to drill this into people there's again there's no technical way to prevent people from doing stupid things never they will do yeah. that Never underestimate somebody's ability to be oppositional towards a policy. Never yeah. underestimate that for a minute. They're very creative. <laughs> they really they'll change their password. If you don't have a minimum password change um, period, they'll literally change their password 10 times in a row to age out um, the amount of passwords that it, history that so it that checked it for they can roll back to their first password. <laughs> um, and I've seen every, and I laugh, not because it's funny again, but I laugh because um, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, yeah, I have seen this in my my work um, supporting users so many times, it would, sh it would just shock you how clever they are. Yeah, they are, they really are. But it's only for stuff that you don't want them to be, but I yep. digress. Um, so yeah, take a look at the report. Again, it's an interesting read. If you're interested in this type of events of cyber crime events and all that, this will paint you a very bleak picture, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So continuing with this trend, we have another report that Sectigo, uh, Sectigo is a CA company. They have certificates, they have some security um, products as well, mm -hmm. um, but they came out with a report from another company that they had uh, ordered from another company. And basically what they looked at was security on websites on the internet. 
um, they had the this I believe a survey um, where they looked at 40 million uh, websites and they found out that on average each website was being attacked 172 times per day 172 so take a moment to let that sink in Wow. You throw up a website, it's on the public internet, and 172 times per day, it's being attacked. When we mention the importance of patching, it's because when many of those attacks are probing for vulnerabilities, for known vulnerabilities on mm -hmm. the system. If you make it easy on them, if you leave them exposed to known vulnerabilities, some of those attacks might find them and exploit them and get into the system. Yep. And yeah, it's just leaving the front door open. And, and sometimes it's just so easy to tell if a company is vulnerable. Um, I can't remember how long ago it was, but Jira from Atlassian, which I, I say that I'm sure a subset of our audience is rolling their eyes right as I say Jira. But, um, you know, that aside, they had an issue where um, it's really easy to find out if this vulnerability that they, um, you know, th that that was announced was something that could be taken advantage of because it was just the contact administrator page. Like literally that was the only requirement. If that contact administrator feature is turned on such that there's a contact administrator page that you're able to access, they were able to just get in. Um, so it's not like really hard to find out if a certain URL path is available because they could just append that to the end of the URL. Does it work? No, they're not vulnerable. Does it work? Yes. Okay. Then, then we can get in. Um, it's absolutely that they're, it, it was, they obviously released a patch for this and um, you know, they did the right thing. A patch was put out, but you know, if anyone who was late on installing it, they um, probably might've regretted that actually, because it's very easy to take advantage of. Yeah. Another very interesting thing that they found was that 93% of the websites that were infected with malware, and yeah, that's something that can happen when your website is exp is, explored, is exploited, is that they don't target your system directly. They don't really care about your system. They just want to use it as a platform to spread malware to your users. And one of the things that uh, indexing sites like Google, they used to do is that when they look at your website and they find that uh, it has malware, they won't list it. So it won't show up on results and it, so that they don't direct the users to your website. Mm -hmm. What these guys found on the survey was that 93% of the websites that had been infected with malware were still listed. Okay, So wow. whatever it is that Google and those types of, uh, of services are doing, they're not finding all the malware. They are still sending users and traffic to the ones that are infected. That's really massive. It really is. And also, WordPress is obviously on the list. I mean, I don't even, if, if you know security fairly reasonably well, you, you already know about WordPress. And, you know, I, you know, full disclaimer, I run WordPress on several sites because it's easy, but I also understand in doing so, I unfortunately am watching it all the time. And I have a, a lot of checks and things and backups and images. And um, it, it happens to all of us. I've, I've seen a WordPress site you know, that I was maintaining some time back, get owned. It just happened. Now, thankfully, I just deleted it and, you know, I backups are that current. I completely um, wiped it out and rebuilt it. But um, the fact is, if you run WordPress, the, this article is also saying that um, plugins impact WordPress um, vulnerability quite a bit. The more, I think that's true of a lot of applications, not just WordPress. I mean, you, you keep on installing extensions and add-ons, even in your browser, it's only a matter of time before any one of them has a vulnerability or it's abandoned by the developer and they're not updating it at all. And if you're not like keeping an eye on this, then that's a big problem. Yeah, because if you look at it, plugins and extensions, like you say, they're problems on their own. Yeah. They just run inside the browser or in this case, inside of WordPress, but they are programs on their own. So they will suffer from the same problems. Um, yep. Additionally, they'll be developed by a different team of people, by different users that are doing the code and people with different experiences. And they might not know and be aware of changes that happened in WordPress that might make it slightly incompatible and they haven't realized that yet. Um, the number that they mention here is actually pretty irrelevant. For every five plugins that you have on, uh, on the website, on the WordPress website, it doubles the risk of impact. Yeah. That's massive. If you think about it, that's massive. Especially when you think that most websites that are running on WordPress will have 20, 30 plugins running at any moment. 
<laughs> so you're basically just again opening the front door for for an attacker and then you yep. all of those have to be kept up to date wordpress Thank actually you. has uh, that auto update feature but the thing is and, by default when it comes to extensions yeah and it's disabled by default because it breaks lots of things and if you've ever run a wordpress website you know this it, whenever there's an update to something you run the risk of your website just not opening anymore and now you have to dig through the logs and try to find out which plugin is causing the issue and go there and manually disable it or remove the yep. files or so that it doesn't get loaded <laughs> Yeah. There. yeah, I've had to SSH yeah. into a server after an extension updated. I had to go to the yeah. plugins directory, rm-rf, the folder that the extension was in, and only then would the site come back. I, yep. I've i probably run into every WordPress problem. And I think the biggest issue with WordPress that I have is that extensions, I mean, it, it, it should be common knowledge that extensions, you know, too many of them are bad, less is more. But extensions with WordPress is part of the culture. It's a whole new level because... Even myself, I was um, at one point, I think it was um, a page on one of my other websites. It's not there now, but I had like all of the books that I've written. I wanted them in a table, just like an invisible table because I wanted them you know, lined up a certain way. And however I wanted to do it, I don't remember. I, I realized that WordPress itself, it doesn't have the ability to make the table look like I want it to look. So the only way for me to achieve what I wanted to do was either to handwrite something myself or download an extension. Guess what I did? I downloaded an extension because that was like the only way that I, I could personally, with my level of web design experience, which is not much, get the table lined up that way. And But that's another extension added. And then that's kind of the culture because if you go to a WordPress forum and you say, I want to do this, you might see a response that could be some, oh yeah, that's built, built right in. You don't need an extension, just turn this on. But often instead it's like, oh yeah, just download an extension for that. Just download an extension. Yeah. And, and even in the forums for WordPress support, they will tell you to do this. <laughs> I have seen replies on those forums where it's just a link to the extension that you should download, no other wording at all on that uh, on that reply oh you i'm asking how to do this i have this problem and somebody just replies with the link and be that and, and now really, you have a new expression new yeah and, and you know um sorry i didn't mean to cut you off but i was going to say um because that reminded me of something that i've seen constantly like even when i ask for support and, and someone does that they give me a link to a um, extension, the first thing I always do every single time, and I'll, I might not even have any interest in the extension, but I might be curious about it. So I'll click on it just to read about it. And then they'll say, um, last contribution was two years ago. <laughs> Why? Like you're recommending I install this extension today, but the developer hasn't even pushed out like so much as a readme change in two years? No. My policy, if I do have to use an extension, if I don't see like some kind of update within the last month um hopefully i'm really skeptical about that plugin because something internet facing is never final there's never a time where a developer can say it's final there's nothing i need to do there's always something that you need to do and that's a big red flag if you look at the last update and spend years that's that's just horrible but they don't even look at that when they post those links yeah one of the good sides of wordpress is actually if years have gone by since the last update it won't work with the current version of wordpress you'll have to, you'll have issues getting that to run because it will refuse to install or whatever but still that is a very valid point there and it looks like we're piping up on wordpress and just going ahead and wordpress is this and that and so on don't worry joomla is just equally oracle in that we could brand so, about every yeah. single software package no matter we can how move good to it the is. next one yeah. We are equal opportunity software complainers here. We have no <laughs> bias. We will find no our bias. favorite Linux distribution, our favorite piece of software. <laughs> I guarantee you we will have something to rant about no matter what it yeah. is. Even a video game that I like to play, I can rant about it being unstable um, as much as I like it. Believe me, where, where there's code, there's problems. Do you know Walter and Stadler from the Muppets? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love those guys. Yeah, so that's why. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> getting back to this last point and mm -hmm. just basically in closing because we've been running for a long time now. Um, one very important point that these guys point out on the on the article is the the fallacy of the underdog. This is a term that they coined. 
um, where most businesses say that they're too small to be targeted. So most companies do not think that they will ever be targeted by an attack, even if half of those have already been targeted by an attack. This is something in the mindset of people that think, oh, nobody will target me. This only happens in the movies, like we always go on about. But it does happen. It doesn't really matter if you're not Microsoft or Amazon or whatever. You're in the internet, you have a public IP address, you will be attacked. That's yep. just a fact of life. How you deal with that, that's what makes the difference. How prepared your systems are, how patched they are, that's what keeps your business going after an attack. But mm -hmm. being in it, being attacked, that's going to happen regardless. That's the only thing that we can tell you with 100% sure. That is going to happen. You cannot expect a different outcome the moment you have your systems online and on the internet. If you want an example of this, um, if you don't believe us, all you have to do is just, um, you know, sign up with a free trial on any one of those, um, you know, VPS providers, spin up an Ubuntu instance with a public IP, you know, maybe you want to write a web website or whatever. But right after you spin it up, just tail follow the var log, um, the, the off log, basically, and just watch it. Like literally, it might not start right away, but it, within minutes, usually you'll start to see like a flood of things go on. And, you know, part of it is like, it is kind of true that a, a small company might not be a target for a human, but they're still a target because it's not even about exactly. somebody, oh, I hate that particular um, small little store in particular. No, there there's automated processes scanning. And when you see like with a VPS device, and you're watching the um, secure log or whatever, um, and you see all these things flying at you. Like you might think you're under attack. Like they're at they're after you. In particular, no. Um, there's automated processes. They you know see an IP is actually responding to pings now or whatever it is they do doing port scans or whatever. And guess what? It's it's nothing personal. But you're on the internet and there's automated processes that are now logging everything that's open on your IP. At this point in time, that's just part of the background noise of the internet. Mm -hmm. And you have to expect that and accept it and live with it. And just don't leave your ports open if you don't have to have some proper firewall in place and patch your systems. That's basically yep. the best things you can do to, to prevent that. But th that happens, that's guaranteed. It won't take you five minutes to start seeing traffic on your SSH ports, for example after you have it on a public uh, IP address. And it, it's, it's kind really of count. fun at first, too. You see, if you look at the, if you're actually watching the logs, you will see the usernames that they're trying. Like, they're going to try admin, they're going to try root, yeah. administrator, like every variation of that, abbreviated or not. And you're going to see, like, regular attempts. Root, obviously, is going to be the first one they try. And, um, you, you know, you you will see that. And I'm hesitant to say, you know, I was kind of joking when I said spin up a VPS instance and, and look at it. I mean, obviously, if you are going to, spin up a VPS instance, definitely look at that if you're curious, but don't spin up a VPS instance just to see if it gets owned because eventually it will if you don't secure it. Mm -hmm. And then you are against the terms and conditions with your VPS provider. They could close out your account um, because you're not doing your due diligence. It's shared responsibility, but I digress. Yeah. Um, like you were saying, um, internet background noise is there and it's a fact of life. It's the way it is. Yep. And yeah, I believe that's enough of the news roundup for today. Yep. So, yeah, we covered some pretty interesting stories today. Um, as usual, they tend to follow the same scheme of things. It's basically attacks and uh, people not doing what they should be doing to protect themselves. With the uh, the difference that we're talking about and we are seeing a lot more of uh, social engineering stuff than we were in the past, um, we have been focusing more on patching and vulnerabilities and exploits in your system that are not patched and all that. But uh, yeah, social engineering has been making a comeback. Yeah, and, and never forget that the the path of least resistance is always the path that someone's going to go down to get into your systems. They're not trying to make anything harder on themselves that they have to be. They're they're you know they want in quick, whatever the quickest way is. That's what they're going to do. And if the quickest way is to call up the receptionist, guess what? That's exactly what they're going to do. Yep, absolutely true. And I believe that's all we have for today, right, Jay? Yep, that's everything. Yeah, we've covered those stories, and um, you know just. 
more cautionary tales of uh, what to do and what not to do when you manage things that are plugged into the internet. And that's a common thread, but that's what we're here for. And um, whether it's news stories or educating people on things like certificates, like we've done recently, uh, we we have no shortage of things to talk about. So um, just uh, make sure you subscribe to this podcast if you haven't already done so, and we will continue to have new things to talk about in new episodes. Sure. See you in the next one, everybody. Thank you. Bye.